mountain Zion from their freedom came a scheme and why
Good morning, San Diego Church family. Welcome to our virtual online worship service. Welcome to the San Diego Church of Christ. We are Tommy and Jessica Tang, and we lead the South Point region. And we wanted to start our worship service off today with some good news. Yes, last week we were able to participate uh, along with the elders and the SD diversity team and many of our members from South Point in an event called Untold Stories. And it was a time that we were together at the park in small groups and uh, just sharing our life, our life stories, our pain, uh, defining moments, you know, victories, just things that we have gone through as it pertains to race and culture. And it was just an incredibly bonding experience. You know, many people who, you know, you've known forever, all of a sudden you get a glimpse into some deeper things in their life. And so I just appreciate uh, the opportunity for connection um, and just to share, to have that platform. So thank you for those who put this together and a special thank you for those who showed up and participated. You know, yesterday was another opportunity we had, part two, where we were able to log on and again, share our stories with one another. Um, so I just appreciate again, the hearts that uh, lean in to this. And I just look forward to more opportunities in the near future uh, for deeper connection as well. Amen. Well, we're kicking off a new sermon series titled Jesus in the City. Cities are full of life, beauty, and opportunities for God to work powerfully in the lives of those who believe. And when Jesus entered a city, crowds gathered around him. He uh, changed their lives. He impacted their lives through his preaching, teaching, and his healing. And so consider all these cities that Jesus visited. You know, I think about Capernaum and where he healed the Roman officer's servant, or Jericho, where he transformed Zacchaeus' life, or in Nain, where he raised a widow's son from death to life. And I think of Cana, where he turned water to wine, or even Galilee, where he started his ministry and called his first disciples. You know, today we're going to launch this new series, and if you're a guest with us this morning, I'd like to invite you to join us on this journey as we take a deeper dive into the life of Christ and how he impacted the lives of those in these cities. You know, as we hear the amazing miracles of Jesus Christ, uh, I want you to reflect on this question. Do you believe that God can work the same way through us and his Holy Spirit to impact the lives of those living in our local cities and our worship centers? Great question. Can God do what he did in Jesus' time in the lives of those around the world today? You know, on that note, let's go to God in prayer. We're going to continue our worship service. And after I pray, we're going to watch a short Kadogo good news video to see what Jesus is doing in the city of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you, God, so much for the opportunities that we get each week to come together as a family, whether in person at the park or virtually. We know that, Father, you are with us and we're one in spirit. And so, Father, as we worship, we pray your Holy Spirit speaks to each and every one of us individually to, to minister to us, God, to call us higher, to spur us on, to encourage us, and also to comfort us. Thank you, God, so much for being a God of righteousness and truth. Help us to draw from your word this morning and be with the speakers, be with the prayers, and be with our time together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm Zach Fazio, and today we have some great news coming out of the churches in Brazil. Miriam has been a disciple since the mid-90s and has always dreamed of being united with her mother in Christ. About 26 years after her baptism, on January 15th, 2021, that dream was realized when her mother, Aristea, was baptized into Christ. On February 8th of this year, Jeff and Amanda Henderson from San Antonio, Texas, along with their three children, moved to lead the campus students in the west sector of Sao Paulo, Brazil. The Brazilians are grateful for the help of their brothers and sisters in the U.S. In 2020, a woman named Corrine was invited to church. In time, she invited 10 friends to come along with her. Later, they invited 20 more people to church. Altogether, she and three of her friends were baptized into Christ. All glory to God. Before the pandemic, Marcelo, a former pastor from another church, began studying the Bible with members of our church in Sao Paulo. Through God's grace, he decided to be baptized and today lives as a disciple of Jesus Christ. We praise God for his work in the churches in Brazil. Thank you for joining us for this Good News Minute. God bless. Spoke away. 
Good morning, church. My name is Fadi Al Hind. My wife Miranda and I are in the middle of a move from LA to join the staff here in South Point. And, and we can't wait to be here with you guys. Um, just like the Tangs have mentioned, we are starting a new series, Jesus in the City. And whenever Jesus started and, uh, or entered a city, sorry, the crowds gathered around him and, and lives were changed by his teaching, preaching, and healing. And I have the honor and privilege to kick off our series today. You know, when I think of, of cities, I, I think of a lot of things, but when I think of a city, I think of a pulse. Cities are the pulse of every country. Cities are the heartbeat of a country. A city is where you find diversity, diversity of thought, diversity of race, gender, and background. It's also where you find generational diversity. You know, movements are started in cities. If people plan a march, they plan it in a heart of a city. You change a city, you can change a nation. Especially in the Middle East where Jesus was. Where I come from, Jordan, uh, in the Middle East, we are a population of 9 million. San Bernardino County is almost the size of Jordan. San Diego County is more than half the size of modern day Israel. And so when, when Jesus and his followers marched into the city of Jerusalem and, and, and people were shouting Hosanna, that wasn't just a headline that people saw in the news. When, people, when Jesus was in a city, people felt that. People were impacted by that. People saw what Jesus did in the city. But also because of, of a city's importance, and its diversity, a city is where controversy is born. That is true today and in the time of Jesus. Every time Jesus walks into a city, there's always the Pharisee and the sinner at the gates waiting for Jesus to come in. Every time Jesus enters a city, we find him in a controversial moment, and you read it, and, and it says that this was set up as a trap by the Pharisees, and you're like, whoo. If you're anything like me, I, I read it and I go, wow, what is Jesus going to do right now? You know, that, that person thinks that Jesus is going to say this, and that person thinks that Jesus is going to say that. Jesus found himself in controversial moments almost every time he enters a city. But he also always comes out able to heal and to teach, to correct and to feed. To be like Jesus in a city, to, to have an impact in a city, is to be able to handle controversy. You know, as disciples, it is hard to figure out how to follow Jesus in these crazy times. It's hard to figure out what would Jesus say. It's hard to even ask the question, does the Bible speak to the major issues that we're wrestling within our city? You know, I have lived in the U.S. now for six years, moved from the Middle East. And let me start off by saying I love being here. I'm grateful every day uh, for the peace, for the safety. I'm grateful for the education I got. I'm grateful for the friends that I've met. I'm grateful, I'm grateful for my wife. And I, I think it's one of the greatest countries in the world. And with that being said, sometimes the culture confuses me. And just from an outsider's point of view, man, there are so many contradictions. And I just want to share some of these crazy contradictions that I've seen or, or felt. Uh, when I first came to the U.S., I was told that Southern California is in a severe drought. But every time I walked outside, I almost always saw someone cleaning their car with a hose. Coming from the Middle East, I don't think you know what a drought is. And then another, another thing that I had a hard time understanding is the humor. The American humor is so sarcastic 
that I just don't understand it. It flies over my head. I'm like the Guardian of the Galaxy guy. I, I just don't understand it. I, I miss it every time. And these are, these are funny contradictions that I see or, or funny weird things that are confusing in the culture. But I also see some, some serious contradictions that I saw in the past six years. And here are some that, that I've seen. You know, I saw the decline of church, but also the rise of celebrity pastors. I saw the rise of hate speech and the defending of free speech at the same time. I saw the Me Too movement rush through our world at the exact same time. Fifty Shades of Grey was the fastest and largest selling book among women of all time. I saw the first African American president in, in American history followed by the election of Donald Trump. At the same time, I, I see the normalization, obsession with technology and a desire to get rid of it at the exact, exact, exact same time. Sometimes I'm confused. And it, is there anybody here that understands what is happening? You know, you, I, a lot of us feel like these tensions in, in our own life. And I feel like things are going from one side to the other. How can one be a disciple in this city? How, how can I get Jesus from walking around the dusty trails of Galilee into modern day San Diego? Isn't that what this series is about, Jesus in the city? You know, I find the biggest hurdle for Christians today is that they have a hard time finding today's controversial topics in the Bible. And so Christians no longer open their Bibles, but instead make up their opinions through social media and people around them. And so today my goal is that maybe I can help you connect with how Jesus changed his city through these controversial moments. I, I'd like to put in front of us that the key that Jesus used is the controversy of compassion. Controversial compassion. That's the title of my lesson today. And, and I believe that's how we can move forward in our city. Let's go to Luke 7 verse 36. And it reads, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a, a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster of jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to, to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now, I want you to see in this moment here that it doesn't matter what time of history you are in. That is awkward. That is an awkward moment. So Jesus is just reclining and then this woman just comes in. She sits behind Jesus under his feet and then she just pours perfume. She begins to take her hair, wipes Jesus' feet with it, and then she starts kissing his feet. I mean, I'm not sure that... The example I'm about to give even gives you the level of scandal this was. This would be equivalent for a stripper to come in and while Jesus was eating, performing at his feet. If, if you were at a, at a minister's luncheon or fellowship and a, and a prostitute came in and performed, you would be saying, what sort of minister are you? How does this woman know you? And what is she doing here performing? This would be controversial. So I don't want us to skip past the moment we find the Son of God in. This is a controversial moment. Immediately in this passage, you see these two instincts that begin to kick in that we can relate to in today's world. The first instinct we see is the temptation to condemn. So verse 39 says, When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who he, who he is touching and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. So listen to this. This Pharisee's mentality of holiness is defined by distance from sin. So the holier you are, the further away you are from people like this. This woman could have made him unclean. It was completely 
inappropriate for a woman to be interacting with men in this sort of environment. Completely inappropriate for her to be touching him in this way. So in the Pharisee's mind, he's, he's, look, he's like, look, obviously this is sinful. She's a lawbreaker. This guy is supposed to be a holy teacher and he's not distancing himself. Instead, he's, he's not even shooing the woman. He's not rebuking the woman. He's not calling her to repent from what she's doing right now. He's not pulling his feet away. Who is this man? And who is this woman? But now, this is what Jesus responds, responds with in verse 44. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I mean, what a question. Do you see her? Do you see this woman? I don't, I don't think you are. All right, now, and then he continues. I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time she entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. All right? I want you to focus on the question he asks. Do you see this woman? You see, Jesus saw the woman. Simon saw an issue. He saw a category of sin. Jesus saw a woman. Jesus refuses the temptation to condemn. You know, this instinct to condemn, this instinct to, on the inside, say, look at that sinner. Look at this situation. I can't believe this situation is being handled this way. I could never be like that. Who is that woman? Who is that man? Get me away. See, that push away from acceptance towards this harsh position of condemnation is present in our world. And to tell you the truth, it is sometimes present in my heart. It is easy to dismiss. It is easy to point out flaws, to open scriptures. But it is hard to look past the sin, past the reaction, and, and look at the hurt or pain, or even the spiritual battle that rages within. It's, it's hard to be filled with compassion and empathy. You know, I am terrible when it comes to compassion and empathy. I am, I'm, like, I'm just like the Pharisee. This is what I see and this is what you should do. And one, two, three, and this is how we fix it. But, you know, my wife is incredibly compassionate. Which is funny because my last name is Al-Hin means compassionate. So... The name doesn't fit me well, but fits her really well. Now, a lot of times, I'm on my phone and, 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 and on a call trying to help a brother out or brother getting advice. And, and you know, sometimes my wife can hear it through the, the phone. And, and, you know, when I hang up, I feel pretty good about myself. I was like, wow, I just, I just killed that phone call. But Miranda comes in and, and she says, you missed it. I was like, I missed it. Was that... What does that mean? She was like, you, mi you missed what he was trying to tell you. And your response indicates that you missed it. I'm like, okay, can you explain a little bit? And she goes, you know, he said this and he said this. And he, what he really wanted to hear is, is that. And what you pointed to him was just do this and do that. And this is how you fix it. But he just wanted you to point him to God. He just wanted you to, to, to feel with him, to be compassionate with him. Man, a lot of times I, I go back and call the, the brother again and I go, all right, here, listen, I, I was thinking about it and this is what I think. And I try to help him, point him to God or feel with him and be, be empathetic, be compassionate. So, you know, she, Miranda helps me with it so much. So if, if, if you're ever on the phone call with me and you go, wow, he did a good job, just know it, it's probably my wife. It's not me, it's probably my wife. But you know... The instinct to condemn in me is strong. And sometimes the instinct to condemn in our cities is strong. And, and it, sometimes we think, well, you're not, you're not thinking this way. Or not, you're not doing that. Or, uh, and, and we come in wanting to confront. The world comes in wanting to confront. Rather than to understand. Now, the second instinct that you see, right? The first one was the instinct to condemn. The second one is the instinct to celebrate, which is also in our city and also in our culture. 
Our, our culture today, especially with my generation and younger, it's about individualism. Celebrate you, be you, speak your truth, listen to your feelings and thoughts, and that's when you're most happy. So at this point of the story, some people might read it and see, and, 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 and see Jesus just and, and think, wow, Jesus just wants her to be her authentic self. A, a, a liberated woman coming in, disturbing these Pharisees, just doing her thing. And Jesus is just okay with it. But if you read the story, you realize that she's in tears because she hates her life. Jesus calls her a sinner and forgives her. He doesn't condone her behavior. She is trying to find a way out of her life of sin, to find hope. And Jesus doesn't say, hey man, no, no big deal, you just be you, I'll be me, it's all good here. Jesus calls her out. Sometimes we, we have a false idea of grace. This is what it says in the book of Titus. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation. And you know what grace does? It teaches us to say no to ungodly desires. To live in self-controlled, upright, and holy lives. Grace not only saves us, it transforms us. It's not just a tutor to show you how to get into the kingdom. It's a tutor that teaches you how to live in the kingdom as a forgiven person. You see, the controversial compassion is not controversial because he just showed compassion. But in his compassion, he challenges and saves. So what does Jesus say in verse 47? Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as a great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. And Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say, who is this who even for forgives sin? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You see, Jesus refuses to fall into the trap of celebrating. What is it that you give, what is it that you give into? You know, think about what is it that you give into? For the woman, it was her sexual desires. But what do you put your trust in? What do you follow? Is it your thoughts, your feelings, experiences, even though they could be valid? And, and they could be there. Do you lean into social media, friends, or sin? What is it that, that is not letting you hear His voice of truth? Jesus realizes that sin ultimately makes you miserable. And He calls her to something else. Something far greater. But are we willing to hear God's voice? Are we willing to hear his controversial compassion, not just its love, but its truth. Are we willing to fall at his feet rather than to stand in our own desires, hurts, pain, or sin? Now, here's the reality, okay? You, you might go, okay, yeah, I, I get that principle, like controversial compassion is like this beautiful third way to respond to things. It's, 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 it's in our minds, we, we sort of think it's like this, we, we don't condemn and we don't want to celebrate either. And so I'm, I'm going to be this middle thoughtful person that just has a great compassion. But this is what compassion actually looks like. Compassion is a mess. Because you're dealing with people. People are not a formula or an ideology or a theology or an issue. They are people. People are complicated. People are broken. People don't move in the ways that we want them to. Or progress the ways that we are, that, that we are appropriate to us. Compassion is always a mess. Compassion lets sinful people touch them. Compassion condones sin in its time. But compassion loves and lets sin interrupt. Compassion will always be a mess. It doesn't, it doesn't fit into your budget. Compassion doesn't make an appointment when you've got time. Compassion is not going to order itself nicely. It's just going to make a mess of your life. 
But this is what it is needed in our city today. Jesus was compassionate, knowing that it will lead him to the cross. Jesus was moved with compassion by the word. See, the word compassion means from the gut. And I don't know if you've ever been so wounded or so moved. Someone maybe you love has done something heartbreaking and you almost double over because you feel it so deeply. This is what Jesus felt for people. It says that Jesus moved with compassion, healed the man, touched him and said, I am willing, be clean. Jesus moved with compassion, saw the multitude and taught them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus moved with compassion, went to two blind men and healed them. His compassion got him out of the category of being the son of God, got him out of the category on, from his throne and made him engage with the mess of humanity. He moved with compassion. To invite Jesus is to invite controversial compassion. You know, are you controversial in your compassion? When you think of, of controversy, you don't think compassion. I don't think compassion. And you might be thinking, oh yeah, I'm, I'm controversial. Just ask the other side or ask this person. Ask those that don't agree with me. They'll, they'll tell you I'm controversial. But that's not the controversy of Jesus' compassion. See, one minute they love Jesus, the next minute they're crucifying Him. Jesus does not fit into our category of Christianity or what our city offers. To follow Jesus is to impact our city. To follow Jesus is to invite controversial compassion. Jesus' is com Jesus is controversial. Jesus is about understanding and a culture of offense. He's about reconciliation and a culture of outrage. He's about humanity and a culture of issues. He's about denial and a culture of self-fulfillment. He's about uh, listening in a culture of accusation. He's faith in a culture of doubt, hope in a culture of fear and love in a culture of hate. Jesus is controversial in His compassion. So the question we have to ask ourselves, and the question that I want you to ask yourself, are we following the God with spit on His face who entered this mess of, of a humanity to take Jesus seriously is to take on the scandal, to take on the offense, the shock, the disdain, the curiosity, the wonder of compassion. Ephesians 4 verse 14 it says that then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by, by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftness of people and their deceitful scheming. You know, I relate to this part of this passage. Now, sometimes I feel tossed around by different views and thoughts and, and just the diversity of thought in, 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 in a city. You know, our city is being tossed. People are being taught our children are being tossed from thought to thought but verse 15 it continues and says instead speaking truth in love we will grow to become in every in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ i love how he uses the analogy of infants and mature people you know infants are tossed around because they speak one way. They know a couple words. They know either truth or they know love. They either condemn or they either celebrate. But mature disciples speak the truth in love. And just like Jesus, they show compassion when the time is right. They also speak truth. I love how he uses uh, the analogy or, or the words infants and mature people. You know, infants are tossed around because they speak one way. They, 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 they speak a couple words. They don't know more than these couple words. They either speak truth or love. They either know how to condemn or to celebrate. But mature disciples speak the truth in love the same way Jesus did at every controversial moment. And as mature disciples, just like Jesus, we can show compassion. And when the time is right, 
we can speak truth. And so, as you break bread, I just want you to think and pray that we can sharpen our tool of controversial compassion. I want you to ask yourself, how am I controversially compassionate? How can I be controversially compassionate? Just like I said, when we we think of the word controversial, we don't think of compassion. We think of so many other things, but God was and Jesus was controversially compassionate. Let us pray. Heavenly Father God, I'm grateful for your compassion. The compassion that loves, the compassion that shows grace, but also the compassion that shows truth. It's incredible how you're able to balance both things, balance uh, truth and love. God, help us in this time and in our city that we are able to be compassionate and also share truth. To not shy away, to not just celebrate, but also to challenge, but also to love. I pray that the first thing that people see in us is love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
family, my name is Marcus Gregg, and I'm here to prepare our hearts for the weekly offering. We all know the story of Mark 12, as the widow gave her two copper coins to the offering. Jesus saw that and told his disciples, truly I tell you, this widow has given more than anyone else. What sticks out to me is that Jesus sees what men overlook. Jesus sees what men overlook. And when he saw the widow's heart, he saw her committed to God. He saw her sacrificial heart and her rich generosity. And let me ask you, what does Jesus see in your heart as we give this morning? Let's reflect on this question as we give to God. Join me in prayer as we pray for our offering this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I wanna thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity just to worship you, God, and just building a relationship with you, Father. I pray that we have the heart as the widow and just having a generous heart for you. I know that you see our hearts behind we give, how we give, Father, and I pray that we just give it all to you, Father God. I love you, and I pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed the worship service today. I hope God really ministered to you. Yeah. I want to thank Fadi for kicking off our sermon series, Jesus in the City, by helping us to see Jesus' controversial compassion, that whatever place, city that he entered, he had this amazing ripple effect to stir the hearts of the people there, yeah. and that we need to also live out this controversial compassion in our day-to-day -day life today. You know, I want to encourage you to come back and join us next week as we have our second installment mm -hmm. of this series, Jesus in the City. And as you already know, I want to make mention the San Diego Church family sends mission support to our sister churches in the Middle East, to the Philippines, to Mexico, and Central America. Mm -hmm. And we want to close out our worship service today with an uplifting video from the MCA Missions sharing about how your generosity has greatly impacted the lives of the disciples in Mexico and Central America. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Enjoy this inspirational video and uh, have an amazing day. Bye. See ya. Hi, my name is Ruben de Anda, and on behalf of the Mexico and Central America Mission Society, I want to say thank you for your continued partnership and generosity in supporting mission work for the 42 churches in Mexico and Central America and in Cuba. During such a challenging year, the churches in Mexico and Central America and our Mission Society Board of Directors were amazed at the outpouring of love and generosity from your church. Over $620,000 was given in 2020 to support the work in these countries. Thank you. I'm so grateful for our Mission Society Board of Directors. Right now we have 11 members and three officers. A church is able to have representation on our Board of Directors with a donation of $50,000. And God has blessed us with a very diverse and enthusiastic group. We do our best to strive to be wise stewards of your financial donations. I want to take a moment to communicate with you a few things. Of the money that was given in 2020, 95% was sent directly to the churches in Mexico and Central America, and 5% went to administrative fees. Now you may ask, what exactly did our contributions support? In 2020, due to the pandemic, many of the churches in Mexico and Central America underwent very challenging times financially. In countries where unemployment benefits and stimulus packages are almost non-existent, several churches lost up to 50 to 60 percent of their weekly contribution funding due to severe unemployment. Along with this, several natural disasters in Central America brought with them other very pressing challenges as well. As a consequence, in 2020, it was necessary that the vast majority of the contributions go to keeping our church leaders employed so that they could be attentive to the spiritual condition and direction of the churches. As well, we partnered with Hope Worldwide to meet the physical needs of many of the members of the churches in Mexico and Central America. In spite of these challenges though, our churches, for example, in Mexico, witnessed an incredible miracle, seeing 454 souls baptized and restored just in 2020. Schools of missions to train next generation leaders were able to continue their work in both Mexico City and in El Salvador for Central America. God is good and we thank you. 
2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 12, 14, and 15 say, This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. Again, thank you for your continued partnership. Know that your brothers and sisters in the churches in Mexico and Central America are overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God because of your kindness and your generous gifts of love. If you'd like more information on MCA Missions, please visit our website and from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Thank you.